Hi, Joy. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Claire. You are all amazing. Thank you so much for coming today. We're just going to be dropping knowledge bombs on everybody. So um, let's just kick it off here really quick. So what we're going to be talking about is probably local SEO. I, I would think we're going to be talking about local SEO today. You and, better be. You know, <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you know, we can always talk about the color of the sky. I mean, yes. this works sometimes, but probably won't help people out so much. So we'll, we'll probably stick with local SEO. So we're going to be dropping knowledge bombs left and right. Top SEO experts are here. And, um, you know, at its core, we're going to be talking about a, how agencies can really benefit from offering Google Business Profile services and local SEO. But we're also going to be kind of talking about what the pitfalls of that are, too. Because let's just be honest with each other in this room. It, it, there can be a ton of little pitfalls that come with offering anything that has to do with Google, local specifically. Um, so um, with that, you know, I think what I want to do is, is I want to kind of go around the room, right? Uh, we all work with GPP in one way or another. And so we are going to start off with the lovely, awesome Joy Hawkins, the yep. most queen of local search, my mentor, my friend. How are you doing, Joy? Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Good to see you, too. <laughs> so you've had your agency now for going on, what, six years? Five. Something five like? years. Five years. Okay, I'm jumping the shark there. All right, so five years. Before that, you were at Imprezio, right? They were doing a little bit of GPP. Well, a lot of GPP stuff, actually, in the insurance industry. So you moved into your new agency. Why don't you talk a little bit about the struggles that you saw when you were at Imprezio and also kind of what you're doing now with GBP? Because if, if I recall correctly, you're doing some pretty interesting stuff, how you've mixed it into your agency. Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge that I had at the agency I worked at before I started my own um, was they wanted to, they were big on scalability. So they wanted things that they could kind of repeat and, um, do the same across multiple clients that we could, you know, train new people on easily, uh, people that didn't have lengthy SEO experience. And uh, I think there was a lot of challenges with that because frankly, SEO is hard. And if you're a beginner and you're learning, um, one thing I gotta kind of say for sure is that cookie cutter approaches don't generally work too well, mm -hmm. especially across different industries. Um, but also across different like geographic areas, like there's just so many nuances to it. So although um, I think some of the processes they had were good, uh, they were really big on like, we want a cookie cutter approach. And then when I started Sterling Sky, I was like, no, I want a custom approach. I want to start every client by doing a really thorough in-depth audit and coming up with like a action plan based on that business and what they're currently um, experiencing and what they're doing well versus not doing well. Um, and I think that's kind of the thing that I feel like a lot of people that tackle local SEO don't seem to get like they they want the cookie cutter scalable approach. I actually hate the word scalable. So we don't use it at my agency. I, I don't like it. I think that scalable is a term that should apply to technology and things like that. But when you're dealing with people, <laughs> which is what SEO is, you're dealing with people, right? Like all of the good that comes out of Sterling Sky, it's the people that we have working there, their collective brains. Um, so I, I just, I have a hard time understanding how you scale people. <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think you're, quality, you're, quality, right? Like that's what yeah. we always, we always put first. It's like, did the stuff that we do actually result in more leads and business for our clients? Like that's exactly. the main question you should be asking. And if you're not looking to make sure that that actually is working and you're just assuming that the same thing is going to work for every single client, you'll probably be, um, disappointed. I think that, and, and great points, Joy, and I think that there's two sides to the coin, right? And I think it all comes down to customer expectation. And if you're not offering local SEO and you're not offering GPP services right now, you're probably not a expert when it comes to local SEO, right? You can do things, mechanical things. And so the two sides of the coin are this. There is the client or the customer that comes to you and says, I must get better rankings. What can you do for me? And that, of course, is going to include an audit. It's going to, it's going to include pay-per-click, of course, right, as well, because that's going to bring you sales. Um, and I mean, as we all know, it's like GBP. There's only a couple different little levers that you can really pull to help with ranking a lot. However, there is the flip side of the equation. And it's a very large and I think underserved market. And it's, it's the market we serve. So of course, I'm going to say this. Um, and that is, is the market that is basically looking for somebody just to manage their presence, 
they're not necessarily saying, oh, you know, hey, I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars to manage my GMB, and that's going to all of a sudden make me number one, right? That's a wrong fit. That's the wrong customer for somebody who does want a scalable type of service. Um, if somebody's like, hey, I want you to be number one, and also I'm going to pay you a couple thousand dollars a month, then that's when they come to somebody like yourself, Joy, where, you know, it's like a full audit, and you're getting deep and straight into the weeds versus it being a cookie cutter kind of cookie cutter <laughs> approach um, mm -hmm. to it. And what I have seen is, is that let's just be real. The majority of agencies that are out there are smaller boutique agencies. They are one to two people usually, and they can only handle X amount of customers. So to do a full SEO service is all kind of unrealistic because they're going to cap out at around 25 customers. If that, even that's kind of stretching it, but if you want to grow and you want to have a scalable business, that's actually profitable and not just lifestyle. Then at that point, you either need something that is replicatable, that is scalable, which is kind of templated, uh, or you need to outsource that to somebody else who can actually do that piece for you. So with that being said, what I want to do is I'm going to move on to the wonderful Claire Carlisle. So Claire, you're with Bright Local. You have you have your you still have your own agency, right? Yeah, okay. I'm one of those boutique agencies that you just mentioned. Yes, and <laughs> and GPP is very 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 much at the core of what you do, obviously. So talk to us a little bit about your strategy and how that works for your business, and also what how do you think it can work for other agencies. Oh, um, so I'm obviously working at Bright Local part of my time. And then part of my time, I service my existing customers. Um, it's been interesting in terms of, um, and again, not using the word scaling, but understanding how much time I can spend working with the clients that I want to work with. So um, I think I'm probably not the best person to advise on this just because I've taken a very different path. But my priorities are really just working with great clients that have a reasonable budget. You know, I can only service a few people, you know, at a time in, in, in terms of ongoing um, services. But one of the things that I really enjoy is like one off consultancy pieces. So coming up with strategy, looking at auditing. Um, so that's another way that you can scale your services if there's only one of you so rather than thinking i'm going to do all these little bits i'm managing someone's gbp you actually sail in and say this is what you need to do this is what internal resource you need and this is what you can expect to get out of it right but of course the, the drawback to doing the consulting piece while it is enjoyable um it doesn't have that recurring component for the agency right and that's a that's a, it's a key portion to growth Mm. You know, it, I mean, your case is, of course, different because you're working with Bright Local. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, it's like in terms of taking on project work, it doesn't just need to be, you know, it can work in sprints. So you're working with someone for six months, for nine months, for 12 months, and then you're training an internal team. So I know quite a few people that run small agencies in that way. So it does depend on what type of agency you want to build. Very true. Very true. That's actually a really important piece right there is understanding the kind of agency you want to build. Do you want to be that agency that says, I offer a smorgasbord of services that is this long of a list. I do everything from branding to PR to link building. You're obviously an expert at everything if you do that. Um, <laughs> you know, Or do you want to niche? Do you want to mm -hmm. niche in, niche down, and really be good at what you do? So the amazing crystal Horton. Thank you, Crystal, for joining us. Um, yes. What do you think about all of this? I mean, you're, you're, I want to hear your perspective. It's gonna, I think it's going to be very unique. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like to take the audit approach for reviews um, and do a specific review audit to see what your clients are currently saying about your services. Then connecting with the customer to see if that's really what they want, if that's what they're looking to attract. Then from there, I like to do a little bit of some keyword research to make sure we put the two together. If these type of reviews and this type of audit doesn't necessarily describe their ideal client, but we also get to see what type of keywords they are ranking for based off of that. So then we restructure or we enhance if it works out. <laughs> I love the fact that you're leading off with that one component, which is, is looking at reviews to improve a business. 
yeah. right? Because that's that's actually a, a hardcore deliverable that you can give. It's not a ranking deliverable. It's a, hey, I'm going to help you improve your business deliverable. Mm -hmm. So um, I really like that approach actually a lot. So just a little bit of housekeeping. So now that we've answered those two questions, thank you, everybody. What we're going to do is, is this is what we're going to cover next. So that way you have a reason to actually hang out, by the way, with us. I'm just saying. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over a little bit about measurements. What kind of measurements, what kind of expectations can you give for, to your clients that's going to make them stay around forever and absolutely love you and not come back to you and say, well, why didn't X and Y happen? Oh, well, we talked about Z. Uh, then what we're going to do is, is we're going to go over a little bit of like some of the recent things that are happening in local SEO that you just do need to know about now. Joy has some really amazing stuff to talk about, um, some fluctuations that are being seen in the, in the industry. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how what's going on with reviews as well uh, in the GPP space. And from there, we're going to touch basically on, based on some of the presentations that happened at local university in Denver. And uh, from there, we're just going to kind of have an organic conversation. So <laughs> let's start it off with Claire. Oh. Let's talk about <laughs> measurement and reporting. And then I want to follow that up with Joy, because Joy, you had a really interesting way of doing measurement and reporting. But I think you recently changed that, if I recall. So lead us off, Claire. <laughs> Come on. It's all, you. all will be revealed by yes. Joy in a moment. Um, I jotted some thoughts down about this. Um, so if you're thinking about offering um, Google Business Profile services and you're already an established, sort of you have an SEO offering um, already, I think it is worth thinking about and knowing that you're going to be plowing into a lot of different data sets for the type of data that you need to be reporting on. Um, and then depending on what data you use, it operates slightly differently when you are looking at local. So I'll just run through what I mean by that. So one of the things is if you're looking at rankings, ideally, rankings are important, but ideally you're not reporting on those to clients. But if you are using rankings, you're going to need to use different tools so you can be very granular. Um, and then if we think about what you're reporting on and what type of client you're working with, I work with a range of clients. So some of them are do it for me. Some of them are do it with me and some of them are teach me. So depending on what they are, I'll need to be I have to need to have different levels of uh, the type of information I'm giving them with regard to uh, reporting and measurement. So we've got a Google business profile. Obviously, a lot of the action and the stuff that is important to the client exists there. You've also got analytics. So if we're thinking about GBP, we're making sure that we tag up all of the links from the business profile so we can see what actually happens on the website. So we're talking about demonstrating our value as marketers. We're also thinking about testing and rolling things out, maybe securing more budget. Um, and we're also thinking about what information we actually need, need to give to the client. And I think Joy, well, everyone will have something to say um, about this, but Joy and I spoke about this recently. Um, in terms of what does the client actually need to know? Well, they need to know what the return has been and what has actually moved the needle. So don't just give them all of this stuff. Make sure that if you've got a massive dashboard of information, it's useful for you as a marketer to understand what's working and what isn't. The other thing that I was just going to say about um, SEOs, one of the things that we use, and this is something I was looking at the other day, we use Google Search Console to help us to understand low-hanging fruit. So if we're looking at, you know, what has impressions, but not a lot of clicks or whatever, um, we sit there and we look at that. But the thing is, if we are tracking our local listings, then Google isn't including impressions of listings in the three pack. So the types of uh, sort of tactics and strategies that we use as general SEOs don't necessarily translate over into local SEO. So it's just another thing to think about. So those are the things. <laughs> Very true. And, and you know, the, the most frustrating thing, and I think this has been with SEO for 30 years, is that um, at the end of the day, if you're spitting out this report that has these metrics and these graphs and, you know, data from Google Search Console, data from analytics, data from, ugh, God forbid, GBP insights, um, you know, the customers are still going to look at them. They're going to be a deer in the headlights and go, so what? Mm -hmm. My calls didn't increase this month. So what have you done for me lately? I'm just kind of curious. 
Uh, it's actually usually not that nice. So with that being said, Joy, and let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about your agency, what you've done in the past and what you've learned. Yeah. Um, so as far as like reporting on value to clients, we do it a couple ways. First is like the, the graph they want to see is leads, right? So that's our opening page on our report. Like have your leads gone up this month, you know, and, and sometimes it's cool to see trends month over month, but we also have some seasonal businesses where some months are nuts and some months are really low. So it's really nice to compare year over year, but like just leads, like phone calls, form fills, you know, chat, chat's a big one. Um, a lot of small businesses still don't have chat on their website, and that's a huge missed opportunity um, for tracking, but also just connecting with more customers. So, you know, are those numbers going up? Which pages are those numbers coming from, right? Like we've had lots of clients where if we were just looking at traffic, it would really skew which where our priorities went because there's some pages that get tons of traffic. Like I think it was um, we had a, a uh, plumber electrician that I was looking at the other day and like their number one page traffic wise is like, can you have a shower when the power's out? It's like, yeah, like a lot of people are asking that question and like, it's great that they rank for it, but these are not people that are necessarily going to be looking to hire an electrician. Right. Um, so being able to distinguish that, I feel like I see a lot of SEO reports where it's like, oh, your organic traffic's going up and it's like, cool. Okay. That, that's good. I'm not saying it's not good, but is it the right traffic? Um, as far as which metrics I look at beyond that, um, I, I, I feel like this is maybe not a common approach, but I love to look at screenshots. So we have actually have a process here where when we're optimizing a page, I actually tell people like search some of the main keywords, take a screenshot, and then after you're done, take another screenshot. And I'm like, does it look different? Um, you know, did we actually move up? Like, are we actually improving what we thought we were gonna improve? Um, so screenshots I feel like are really helpful for showing as well to customers, like, hey, this is where you are, this is where you are, and then that should translate into traffic and leads. And then for like what keywords to target, Google Ads data trumps everything. Like, I mean, if you've got Google Ads accounts running, this is where you get value from all that money you give Google, because it'll tell you what keywords actually draw leads. Outside of that, second I would say is actually Google Business Profile queries. So search queries inside Google Business Profile listings, which most big companies don't even know exist. Right. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, it's in the API now, right? It just got no, added. Still not, not, still not, nope, okay. still not in the API, I wish. Okay. Heard that from Yext, so I don't know if it's coming. but It um, might be coming in the next release. The next release is yeah. right around the corner, so it's possible. Fingers like, crossed. I hope so. Oh, my God. Yeah, so maybe I, I think it's coming. I don't know. I was told by a pretty reputable source that it's coming. Um, so <laughs> yeah, search queries are super powerful because they don't, uh, search console is, is the worst out of all the places to look for keywords. Um, the keyword data in there is so wrong, missing so much reporting, like under reporting on things. Um, search queries are a little better inside Google business profile insights because at least they are unique to the user. Um, so it's not like picking up as many rank trackers or, you know, like Claire mentioned, mobile traffic doesn't even show up. Like searches on mobile don't even show up in, in Search Console. So getting used to looking at that data, I feel like is a bit of a stretch for people that are not normally in the, the dashboard all the time, like like you and I, Ben, obviously. But, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and on that note, and by the way, you know, Joy, you just need to kind of take your mic and go like this, just saying. <laughs> but uh you probably can't do that no but um no seriously that was that was some really that was some great information it was a great fire is what that was and i agree and my only thing that i can even come close to adding to that right now today is going to be a little bit more about the the performance data from from gbp so you know when you go into gbp you've got the gbp insights which insights has always been wrong you know it's it's junk data um and it's it's going away sooner than hopefully sooner than later, but when you go in there, the click on the seed performance data because that data is actually raw. It's real data. It's most of it's updated actually in real time. So, um, but from there, you can take a look at things that do move the needle for your customer, and you can do a month over month, and you could do a year over year comparison, which is really cool. And, um, you know, you can look at calls, you can look at directions, you can look at messages. These are all conversion factors. 
And then, like Joy was saying, you can look at the the queries. And again, this is raw data. This is actually how people are finding you. I had to use it the other day when we had a client who had an issue with uh, some. Basically, they they thought they had fallen completely off of maps, and I was like, "No, you're actually you're right here." But they're like, "But we're not being found for this key term." Go into performance data, take the key term, emulate the location. Really, you're not showing up for that? Oh well, what are you doing here then? Uh, turned out to be that their employee was looking at it from a different county <laughs> anyway. So, um, but yeah, it's it's all very good data and it's actually, it's, it's actionable data. It's something that the client can look at and be really happy to actually see and they're going to understand it. Um, especially if you join that with the, the percentages that you can see difference on like, you know, mobile and desktop, which is also in the performance data. So that's really handy too. So on with- that then... Yes. Just the, on the move from insights to performance, there's some metrics that are missing, which make me a bit sad, which is a breakdown of where your driving directions requests are coming from. That That's really nice. And we're losing that data. Can you fix it then? No. As a matter of <laughs> fact, I'm in the camp that's actually really happy it's going away. Oh, really? um, you know, we, we had a very intense discussion with Google about this, actually. And uh, it really came down to one question. Okay, so what do you use that data for? Well, we need, okay. yeah, my attractions use it to understand, you know, a relative where their people are traveling from. So it was quite useful to back up data for oh, okay. where should we be targeting ads or yeah. where should we be leaving flyers or where should we be doing local radio? So it <laughs> is actually quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so i mean unfortunately uh, i can't say whether it's going to be coming to the new insight okay. performance data or not but yeah i wouldn't hold my breath i guess is what i say uh <laughs> that's about all i can say about that no but um so crystal <laughs> over to you what about yeah. you what are your thoughts on all of this mess of stuff well i i think sometimes it's really hard especially when you have a client that comes to you that have, they've trained themselves, right? I check Google search console or what is that? So um, Google analytics too is another one that's often pulled up, but they're just looking at all users or it's going straight to Google business. And that's how they're making decisions based off of how they know how to navigate through um, insights. So we kind of take a different approach, more of a customized where we meet them where they're at. We start looking at what their goals are. A lot of the time it's how on earth can I get my phone to ring or my phone call stopped, you know, that kind of thing. So then we start looking and digging into seeing how they look at the data and then readjusting and retraining over time so that they understand (laughs) this is what we need to be looking at. (laughs) (laughs) Over time is the key phrase that's right there because retraining somebody on how to look at keyboard and rankings is uh, to looking at ROIs. Yeah, I I do like, Joy, like your idea of the screenshots because sometimes there's those clients that call in a panic of, I'm drinking coffee, searching all my keywords right now. <laughs> and then you get, you get some different data from that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. So with that, um, Joy, you have some interesting ripples that you've been seeing in the local search forum recently. So tell us a little bit about what, uh, what's going on. What are you starting to see here? Yeah, just some stuff went crazy over the weekend. So we're getting a lot of traction on this one thread that's uh, posted over at the local search forum talking about ranking drops for service area businesses. So what's interesting, what I love about the forum is that like when you start to see tons of people all saying the same thing, you know, there's something going on, right? Like it's not just you. (laughs) Um, Sometimes we get threads where it's like, no, it's just you. But um, (laughs) this case, it's like a lot of service area businesses specifically. So listings that don't have addresses on them, like, you know, plumbers that work from home or, um, you know, like a lawn care company, for example, um, they're seeing drops like where they just fall off completely, like they're ranking and then they're not ranking anywhere whatsoever, like not page one, page two, et cetera. Um, All the different, you know, industries, um, the one thing in common that they have is they are all service area businesses for the most part. 
One of them said they did something yesterday where they went into their listing and added their address back and instantly within like an hour, the rankings came back. So there is something going on. I couldn't tell you what, but I have seen this before. So we had this happen years ago to a client. It was actually back in the days of map maker. So I'm really dating myself here, but um, we added his address back and literally like, boom, he popped up and it was, it was crazy. I was like, my mind was blown. I'm like, that shouldn't have that impact. Like, why is that doing that? Um, haven't seen it in a while, but uh, there's some theories on that thread. Like maybe the Kansas bug is back. So these businesses are ranking in Kansas instead of where they're supposed to be ranking. So some people are seeing that with some of their listings. So I guess if you have a service area business and you're experiencing this stuff, feel free to head over there and chime in on the thread, but don't panic. Uh, you're not alone. And if it is a bug, I'm sure Google will fix it um, as they usually do. And in, in, in put that in time. Yeah, in <laughs> their like, timeline, not yours. Yeah. Yeah, like how long has the Kansas bug been around now? I think it's a lot over, we're extending out over a year. It was like it fixed though. And then like, this is like a you know, whole new batch. Yeah, I don't know. They exactly. obviously didn't patch whatever it is that causes it. I, I don't know. Somebody threw it out on Twitter, actually. that They were seeing a bunch of businesses that were supposed to rank in New York and now they're ranking in Kansas. So mm -hmm. it looks like we're going to have to go tell our friend what's going on here. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit of a different theory. And I've been kind of thinking this for about the past two years. And I've been predicting it for at least the last one year. But I think there's going to be some major changes to how service area businesses are handled by GBP and MAPS. Um, you know, we've seen the new kind of local categorical finder, you know, that has the ability to sort by service areas. So that's kind of been, it's been hit and miss as far as a rollout goes. It's, it's not 100% as far as it's going to be an actual feature. But, I mean, it's so detailed, it's kind of crazy to think it wouldn't be. And, you know, maybe, again, these are all just it's guesses more than anything else, but maybe there's something coming down the pipe where they've actually figured out how to separate SABs from storefront rankings. Um, and maybe that's part of this. Who knows? Maybe it's just a test. Then again, they could oh, just be there's messing also with us. two algorithm updates going on, right? There's the helpful content update last week. Then there's the core update that's like rolling out as of this week. And one thing I do want to put out there that I feel like a lot of people don't realize is those updates do impact local results. So people seem to think that it's like organic only, and that is not how it works at all. So um, that organic. definitely could be at play here as well. Yeah, organic absolutely impacts local 1,000%. We had a client actually, as soon as uh, the helpful content rolled out, we only had one client get affected, which was kind of cool. Uh, but because like nobody's seeing anything happening. And uh, it turned out that they did have a ton. All of their pages on their site were plagiarized from other websites and mm -hmm. um also all their other pages were keyword stuffed to the gills like literally it was like you know locksmith 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 kind of stuff so um so if anybody they they deserve to probably be hit by that helpful content update <laughs> so maybe it is part of that it's always possible so i don't know claire crystal do you have any thoughts on what joy is talking about as far as sabs i don't work with any at the moment i'd be really interested to see what happens with the actual use of service areas because you know in the olden days we used to like mark a you know what what was the circumference of the circle that we would serve and then it was service areas and clients thinking that if you add a service area of the world then they're going to rank all over the world so i think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what a service area is and when you actually verify the business listing, that's the address. That's your pinpoint, isn't it? For your, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, yeah, interesting. What's going to happen with that? Because um, it's not really very fair for a, you know a good service area business to be penalised and not to have the visibility um, in the map. So it would be nice if it was a bit of a more level playing field for like proper good businesses yeah so we have uh two questions we want to get to really quickly so um the first question comes from melanie hendrixels and i hope i got that right melanie and that is is cpc a good proxy for organic keywords with local buying intent or is the top page bid low and or slash high a better proxy 
Or is it something else? I would say that intent, this is, I'm not a, a, a paid person, but intent comes from analyzing the intent of the keyword rather than the cost per click. So I'd be looking at and analyzing at a keyword level what we think it is. And then I'd be looking at the SERP for that keyword to understand what Google believes the intent is. So um, yeah. nothing, nothing to do with CPC really. Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to say the same thing. Look at the search results. If there's a three pack, then there you go. Google thinks it's local intent. They usually get that right. Yeah. I mean, a higher CPC is really going to translate more into how many other people are trying to bid on this term. That mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of people actually looking for that term. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's, that uh, is extremely common. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. So the next question we have is from Jason Bersad. So Jason's asking, how long does it take Google to address GMB, GBP suspensions? We've been waiting for nearly three weeks now. So I'm sorry, Jared. First of all, I feel for you. I understand where you're coming from. We deal with hundreds of these cases a month. Um, however, uh, because we deal with hundreds of suspensions a month at state demand, that means I can actually give you an answer. And that is, is currently right now, GBP is very backed up when it comes to customer support, especially especially in the reinstatement department. So what that basically means is, is the current wait time that I've noticed, this is not an official SLA from Google, but that I've noticed is between 15 to 22 days. So if you've been going on three weeks, if it's exactly three weeks, you'll probably be hearing back maybe tomorrow. And that's when you're going to get your determination. So um, be patient. And they should get back to you. If you do not hear from them in the 22 day mark, I would give it till at least the 30 day mark, just in case, because again, they are backed up. Um, and then uh, the basically what you can do is you can reach out to support and say, "Hey, what's up?" In a sense, quote unquote, um, do an appeal. And if that doesn't work, then you can always come to the community and we can see if we can find out if it's something that's stuck. But right now, I'm just going to say you just have to be unfortunately patient. Okay, with that, let us move on. And is there anything else that you want to talk about um, as far as like, you know, recent things or things that are happening in the local space, Joy, that we have kind of missed so far? I mean, I'm going to go over the review stuff, but. Yeah, nothing really substantial. I know that Google is starting to, you know, sunset some of the COVID stuff, like attribute wise. And, and so I would expect the next thing that's probably going to go is like COVID posts. You know, those are still a post type, but not expecting those to be around very long. Um, and then I know offer posts, um, if you do a lot of posts on Google offer posts, there's a like, I think it's a bug. I don't know, I've really got a straight answer from Google, but they don't show up properly on um, desktop, but they still show up really well on mobile. So um, if you're wondering like, where's my post? Why isn't it showing up? Um, that's kind of a ongoing issue that I feel like we brought that up months ago and I don't know yeah, why it's didn't they move? Didn't they move them to under uh, updates? In on mobile, like they're um, yeah, they're moved. They have like a they have a tab, but like on desktop for lots of people, you search that have offer posts, you don't even see the offer posts anywhere. Um, really annoying, but I'm pretty sure that's a technical issue. Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Um, you know, as far as with GBP, I mean, I will bring up the the one thing. This is this is that their um, GBP is still a hot mess when it comes to reviews. And um, unfortunately, I don't think it's a bug, uh, and I don't think it's a dial that's turned up too high. It's just kind of it is what it is. But the first one I will talk about, I think, is a bug. And this is going to be where brand new profiles are basically being firewalled from getting new reviews. Very, very... Uh, actually really horrible from a merchant's experience because, you know, A, if you're going to do a LSA, well, guess what? You need five reviews before you can activate LSA. So there's that. And then you want to get reviews because you want to get to that first 10 reviews so you can start ranking pretty decently for your profile. So, but unfortunately, new profiles, new reviews can be firewalled anywhere from three to six months. If it is past that three month mark, you will absolutely want to come to the forums and tell us about it. So uh, we can get a word from Google on when that's going to be lifted 
um, or if it may be hopefully just kind of kick them and get it lifted for you. Uh, the other two bugs that are going on with the reviews, one's called a new review ghost and one is called an old review ghost. So the new review ghost is basically when a customer has left you a review, they send you a screenshot and they're like, hey, I left you a review. And you're like, oh, I don't see it. Um, well, that means that either there's a problem with your profile or there's just a problem with that account or some other thing. Either way, the review is just being not filtered. It's just not showing up. Um, again, gather screenshots of these because you can reach out to support which will be less than helpful usually and uh, ask them if they can find it. And if they can't, then you can always come to the forum and then somebody that one of us product experts can go ahead and ask Google, see if they can find it. And the last one, which is probably the worst one of all of them is the old review ghost and um, uh, net media consultants. You go to support.google.com forward slash business forward slash community. Uh, that's where you find the forums. So, um, but the old review ghost, what's the problem with this is, is let's say you have a thousand reviews and you wake up in the morning and now you have 800 reviews. Um, this is what's happening. Obviously that's a larger amount of than probably usually go missing. But uh, in that case, it's very difficult to get them back um, because Google would need something to really compare it with. And most people don't have anything to compare it with. So, but again, you can reach out to support. You can ask them what happened. They'll give you a generic response more than likely that just says, here's why reviews go missing. And, um, but again, you can come to the community if you really are running into a pickle like that. As far as I know, I think that's the major big bugs actually today going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so with that, Joy, I'm going to throw it right back over to you because local you Denver, um, it was a really great show. We finally got back together here after what was almost three years of not seeing each other in person. And so, um, so all, yeah. So tell us a little bit about lead, lead us off, lead us off with your overall thoughts and feelings on the event. Um, you have an upcoming virtual in November and, uh, what was your favorite session? Yeah, well, Yours, oh goodness. you can't put me on the spot like that. I like it. <laughs> okay, so not my favorite session, but there's three that I took takeaways from that I thought would be more uh, of interest to this audience. So um, first session was Lily Ray. Uh, Lily Ray talked about Google Discover, and I feel like this is something that the local SEO community doesn't really even know exists, um, because it seems like it's not a very local thing, but it actually is. Like, we've got especially realtors, we've got a lot of clients that have a lot of traffic from Google Discover. If you're not sure really what the heck is Google Discover, if you have an Android, um, which statistically lots of people do, um, and you have your Android and you swipe right, uh, there is a feed that's on there that basically is catered to you. So in my feed, I see nothing but board games and Mario Kart stuff and you know TV shows I watch and stuff like that. Um, so it's very customized. And so if the person is interested in whatever it is that you do, so like if I'm researching stuff about moving, for example, that's when I would start to see like real, st real estate blogs, and things like that. Um, so it's really targeted, really cool. And, um, you know, people ask like, how do you, how do you get that? Well, R Lily Ray actually has some guides out. So you can Google like Lily Ray, Google discover, and you'll see a bunch of her tips. Like she's got some really solid ones. Um, but I think her main thing was like SEOs aren't even looking here or optimizing for discover. And she's got a whole checklist of things to like optimize for. But one of the funniest things she said that I thought was really just awesome is like Google tells you in their discover guidelines that you should not use clickbaity titles, but they did a whole bunch of testing and research on it. And guess what gets the most activity in Google discover clickbaity titles. So she was talking about how basically when you're writing for Discover, you kind of it's different than SEO where you're just shoving you know keywords in your title, hoping you rank for them, um, which is really fascinating. But that's the you know one minute version of her presentation. Um, my colleague Carrie Hill talked about content, which is always a hot topic, and just basically this is another concept that I feel like people don't seem to get in the local SEO space. But more is not always better. So cannibalizing your content, we see this all the time. Um, we were even having the discussion the other day, if you have, you know, a lawyer client that wants to rank for 18 wheeler accidents or truck accidents, do you need two pages or one? Like, that's the question, right? Like, cause 18 wheeler is sort of a different keyword than truck accidents per se, but they're really the same thing. So it's like her whole presentation was basically that, you know, if you can, um, less pages 
about the same topic is usually better. Um, and we've seen lots of cases where we've done that, where we consolidate crap that doesn't get any traffic or conversions. Um, and most local sites that we audit have a ton of those, like a huge amount of traffic, uh, pages, sorry, in their sitemaps that they're telling Google to crawl an index that get no traffic, no conversions. You need to deal with those. And then finally, my own presentation, which I'm definitely not classifying as my favorite, just to be clear, that would be very <laughs> egotistical. Um, I talked about reviews. We have yet to publish this anywhere because I'm speaking on it a couple of times um, coming up in the, in the future months. But um, we did a, a lot of tests around reviews in the last year. And um, my TLDR for my presentation is um, reviews do impact ranking, not shocking discovery by any means. But we did find that um, getting to 10 reviews on your listing gives you a ranking boost. Whereas like if you jump from like 10 to 15 or 15 to 30, you will not see the same jump or ranking boost. So that magic number, if you're looking for one, if you've got a new profile is 10, which I think Ben already alluded to. And then if you're trying to figure out like which reviews Google actually surfaces at the top. So when you search for your business and you click reviews, you know, sometimes they'll surface like these old negative reviews at the very top and it drives people bonkers. They're like, why is Google showing this old negative review? There are trends to those as well that we also tracked and monitored. So the, the main ones to keep out for are uh, three things. Longer reviews will stick higher to the top longer. So if you've got a whole bunch of clients that are leaving, you know, two sentence reviews and you've got one giant pissed off customer that leaves a rant that's five paragraphs long, your rant review is probably going to stay up longer than your positive reviews. The second point is photos. If you have a photo with your review, it'll stick way longer um, at the top. So quick tip is if you get some negative reviews or you get one or two, email a couple of your clients that's left your reviews in the past and say, hey, can you go back to your review and edit it and add a photo? And it's like insane what happens. Like I had some like before and after showing like just literally the order flipped. It was crazy. And then the final, it was crazy. Like I was just like, pfft, like did not expect that. Um, <laughs> the final thing was local guides and this one made me cringe, but like local guide <laughs> reviews did stay tend to stay longer, like up in the top list than people that were not local guides. So it was just like, ugh. but those were the, the main things. <laughs> right on. Yeah, no, we did that trick actually. You know, what I really want to know is, is like uh for instance, is does that trick affect the three which are featured? And I think the answer is no. But it doesn't. Those yeah. don't change. Like unless you get one deleted or like, oh wait, Claire, Claire's you guys oh, what do you that? got, Claire? What do you got? <laughs> they no, I'm, like thinking, <clears throat> I'm just thinking, and I can't remember the words. Um so there's the three that you get, which are the Google selected ones, which are sort of Google tells us they're algorithmically generated. OK, and then there's the other version, which is based on your most popular review topic bubbly things. And I can't remember what they're called again. And it was sort of moving back and forth between the two. Sometimes on mobile, you always get it based on the reviewy bubble things. And then on a desktop, I'm seeing more of this sort of Google selected. Um, so I'm still seeing it moving around. And obviously, it is not super easy to influence it. You know, you can't just press a button and say it's these one, two or three. But if Google mm -hmm. is basing, as you can imagine, it would do its algorithm on um, the number of times a similar word or theme is mentioned in reviews, then you need to set about getting more of those reviews with those types of um, attributes in them. So it can be managed uh, and it can be influenced, but it's not at the press of a button. But you can look a little bit deeper into your reviews um, to understand um, common themes, common words, the nuance of reviews. Yeah, Claire, the one you're talking about on a desktop is the one I was referring to that I said doesn't change. We tracked oh, yeah, a year yeah. and a half, yeah, a year yeah. and a half for a business. I checked it constantly. It didn't change. Like, it doesn't matter how many new reviews they got, how detailed they were, how rich they were, like nothing changed. That. I don't know how often Google updates it, but if I had to guess, I'd say once every three years. Um, I'm going to have a look. I've got, I've yeah, I've got, I've got done by a third party. I've got screenshots going back about two years for one business. And I, I just want to have a look yeah. to see if anything yeah. changes. The yeah, one thing yeah. that we did see changed it is we had one where the one of the guys that was featured deleted his review and that Ooh. changed it. Ah. So, but I mean, how can you control that? Yeah. 
Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Those are crazy. I wish we could control them, but I don't, well, I don't think we can. All right. So um, now we're going to address some questions. So if you have any questions, please throw them into the comments area, peoples, by the way. Um, okay. So Brian Evans uh, has a question. How do you deal with profiles that probably has been hit by the possum update? That wasn't like years ago. Um, uh, the day the dentist ranks number one organic, but it's not in the local pack unless you zoom in. Okay, dentist, that makes sense. They're not. Uh, they're number one in local pack. Is there any benefit to adding the Google listing address to the description of why to YouTube videos oh, yeah, and channel question. bio? Uh, yeah. uh, that that that's a grilled cheese to pull apart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll start off with possum was years ago. Um, and so I'm not sure why you'd be thinking about possum right now, unless maybe there's another dentist in the same exact category. Um, that's possible. But so they're not I in think, local, unless you zoom I think in. if I'm understanding it correctly, they're referring to the filter, which is the, it came with possum, like before possum, there was no such thing as a filter. Right. Um, but the filter will filter out dentists a lot, actually, because they're so close together. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a dentist in the same plaza as you, or even across the street as you, that could be what's filtering you. Um, that happens all the time. And there really isn't a permanent solution to it other than to... Let me think. You could rebrand to try and include the keyword in your business name. That will help. Um, yeah. I mean, it's one way. Or it's move. Um, you know, we've actually had lots of clients move. I've gone to clients and told them you need to move <laughs> if you yeah. want your uh, your traffic to go up. So I've, I've actually run into this several times with a few lawyers because they tend to be in buildings, like high-rise mm -hmm. buildings. And there's like, you know, 15 floors and 12 other lawyers in the same building kind of thing. But it can happen if somebody's across the street. It's basically within 200 feet of wherever your, yeah. your pin is. Exactly. Exactly. And that's actually, I mean, believe it or not, that's something you can do, which is you can actually just move the pin. And sometimes that works. Sometimes. <laughs> yes, Claire. Just wanted to ask a question <laughs> about that, that Brian, this might help Brian. Um, so if there are, so if you're being filtered, and like the business that appears above you is all that based on who's closest to a uh, location measurement or is that based on the sort of authority of the listing? Could could he ever move out of the filter just by being better than everyone else? No, it's, it's based on it's based on relevance. So it actually okay. changes based on the query. So for example, they could be filtered for dentist. Let's just say it's in, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale. So they could be filtered for dentist Fort Lauderdale, but totally fine for emergency dentist Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's different based on the query and it's whoever is the most relevant to that query that wins. Exactly. Race. Okay. It, it's it's very much, an, it's, it depends okay. scenario, which of course we all yeah. love in local SEO, yes. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Um, and then his other question was, is there any benefit to adding the Google listing address to the description of the YouTube videos and channel bio? So I'm just going to come out and say this. Anybody who tells you that you can leverage other Google properties and it's going to help you rank is feeding you a line. No, the answer is, sorry, adding your address to YouTube and your channel bio is not going to help you. Adding it to a Google site is not going to help you. Adding it to Google Sheets is not going to help you. Sorry, I had to go on a small rant. Uh, but yeah, your answer is no. Anybody else have anything you want to add to that? Come on. You don't want to say the geotagging and exif data is really going to help you a lot? <laughs> also, another myth. Geotagging and exif data will not help you rank at all. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, Rich Keller says clickbait is only bad if somebody doesn't click. <laughs> Fact, actually. So, um, okay, so we got 10 minutes to go. And let's see, what are we going to talk about here really quick? Let's see. All right, so. Um, yeah, all right, we'll go with uh, Byron. 
So uh, let's serve national, international clients. Should I designate a local service area or remove my address or something else? So the, the answer to there is this, is that the service areas are meant to be there based on your business model. It's not based on ranking. It's based on the business model. So in other words, let's say um, you have uh, Brian's you know, Italian restaurant and people come to you. So you definitely want to have your address showing. But let's say you also do deliveries. If you do deliveries too, then you would or could designate a service area. But again, it's only visual. It's not going to help you rank. So um, service areas can also cause and lead suspension as well. So weigh that as a benefit or a risk, I should say. Um, is, is it worth it to go ahead and add a service area if your mic gets suspended? In my mind, the answer is usually no. But um, Joy, thoughts? Yeah. Um, so this is just video related, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. They're asking they serve a national, international client. Should I designate oh, a right, local sorry. service area? Not oh, sorry. Question. Yes. sorry, I was still on the video question. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't have any I would agree with everything you said. I don't have anything to add to that. I think it's based on your your business model. And I think people just don't understand that the service area doesn't impact ranking. So what's, it doesn't matter where you put your service area, really. Um, if you put the service the entire United States, however, it's a good way to get your listing suspended because Google's going to be yeah. like, you don't qualify for a listing. So wouldn't do that. But it, it really it's not a big factor. Do whatever you want. Yeah, and the and the rule there, which just so everybody knows, is is two hours normal driving distance from your point of verification. So if you're like in California, then obviously two hours is not going to work. You're not going to cover the entire state. So mm -hmm. in the case of an international or national client, um, you really need to ask them yourself what what's their business model, mm -hmm. and do they need local presence at all? Really, is what it comes down to. You know, do they have, um, you know, I don't know if we're talking about overseas, if we're talking about, you know, in the United States, but do they have an office in every single state? You know, most businesses who serve nationally, internationally, it's usually like, you know, I'm a consultant and that's it. You know, it's like I do consulting online per se, and, you know, it's not even local. So uh, they might not even qualify, you know, for a GBP in the first place. So again, go back to the business model. And uh, if they do serve multiple states, then uh, they would need a, you know, like a legal nexus and an actual office in those states to set up a GBP. You can't just set up a GBP of people's homes or, you know, Regis's, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Crystal, Claire, any thoughts on this question? Not on that, but I have got a question for you. Do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> just talking and thinking about eligibility of listings. So this, I'm going to... I'm going to say, what would you do in this situation? So say, for example, there is a business that is online only and they're in some sort of retail category. Say, for example, they offer curtains, online curtains. Um, but they also have a place where you can order online and then you could go and pick up your delivery. Now, if they set up a Google My Business listing for that, then surely they're... Um, the category should be like warehouse or something, not curtain shop. Correct. So I yeah. So yeah, would or corporate uh, office or corporate office. So I see that quite a lot with online only businesses, like getting visibility via. Because for me, that doesn't serve someone that is looking to buy some curtains because they go, oh, I'd love a lovely pelmet and some beautiful sashes for my uh, for my library. And then they'll curtains near me and then they'll pop along and it's a warehouse. You know, it's not a wet, yeah. you know, they can't go and buy anything. <laughs> what would you do about that? Is it okay or not? I've been talking a lot, go joy. <laughs> totally okay. Um, actually, we mentioned this with insurance companies, right? Like let's say State Farm, for example, their corporate office is in Bloomington, Illinois, and they don't want their corporate office ranking for when people search for auto insurance because you can't call the corporate office or go to the office to get auto insurance. So it would use the category, you know, corporate office. Um, so I'd say in your example, Claire, it would make no sense to use the curtains category because you're not trying to rank locally. Your customers aren't coming locally. They're coming, you know, nationally. Just keep in mind, if you use the warehouse category, you are not going to show up in, you know, curtains near me queries for people near your office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as well, based on what you said, you don't want them to anyway. Right. They're just right. coming yeah. there to pick this, up. This isn't just, just, uh, just, just 
Sorry, this isn't my client. This is just a, a situation about whether or not <laughs> that is a bit of a spammy listing or not. <sighs> Okay. No, if it's something that people need to get driving directions to, and it's a real staff location, then you're absolutely allowed. What you're not allowed to do is like where nobody's you know supposed to show up. Right. And so like somebody that, you know, sells flowers out of their home, um, but it's like nationwide and nobody comes mm -hmm. there. They don't go to anybody. It's all virtual. That would not be allowed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And then you can nuke it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so nice of you. <laughs> so um all right so melanie so let's see do you need to create separate site pages for every location on uh, that an sab works in hard to do this without dupl duplicating content well that's very true um claire you have something to say oh no i was doing a little head wobble i was just oh, enjoying okay. it but right. i do have some things to say but i i'm gonna get crystal to say something because uh we need to hear her voice more. <laughs> okay. yes um, well, I'd say where Joy talked about what uh, Carrie Hill, I, I think at Local U, Carrie Hill talked about this quite a bit, where if you're focusing on specific city pages or site pages to discuss what is specific about that area so that it's not duplicating content and you're not doing the cookie cutter stuff that is just not popular anymore. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you know, then again, I mean, it's like if you've got an SAB and you want to work for, you want to rank organically, like I was talking about earlier, for mm -hmm. city pages, you know, where you're not near, right? Then that's mm -hmm. actually important. And you do want to have service slash city pages that target those areas. Um, again, it, it does. It gets really difficult as far as like, you know, writing content. Um, and it's like you have to spin up an AI writing bot and be like, oh, it's going to, you know, rank, it's going to write all the best copy for me for all these location pages. No, you, you need a professional writer that can do something with good, um, especially with the helpful content update. So <laughs> the fun fact about that, I, I talked about a local year years ago. I think well, it was Colin that talked about it. We have a client that has a bunch of service area pages, like 20 something. All they do is swap out the city name on their service area pages. That's nothing else. And they came to me for like five years ago and I looked at them and I was like, these rank really well. I'm not going to touch them. And so <laughs> we didn't really do much with them. And after the helpful content update, they're still ranking phenomenally. So wow. yeah. <laughs> Gotta love exceptions, not the rules. <laughs> or I would just go in and I'd put FAQs, questions that are specific to the area that have to do with the keywords and those type of things, where then I saw a little bit of a difference when we took a dip. Um with the helpful content, but then that seemed to kind of replace it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, but and the the thing that I think, Joy, that you're bringing up there, that's really important, and people need to understand as agencies in general, right? Because we, we are talking, we we're talking about agencies here back in the beginning, and that is, is don't be afraid to experiment. Really, seriously, don't be afraid to experiment. The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work. That's all. You know, your customer is not going to yell at you. Your customer is going to praise you if it works. So like in a situation like Joy is talking about, it's working. Okay, so if it's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just because mm -hmm. the, the entire dogma of the industry says it's against the rules, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Dogma can be wrong a lot. A lot. <laughs> Google says a lot of things they don't enforce too. So, you know, these best practices... Yeah, I can tell you that uh, a good friend of mine who used to work at Google that everybody knows, I'm not going to say his name, uh, once told me about the percentage of information, which is disinformation that actually gets put out there. And it's pretty <laughs> darn high. So I say experiment. Like, for instance, if somebody says an exact match domain is not going to help you. Anyway, <clears throat> try it. I'm sure you'll be surprised. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's see. Um, so, okay, so uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so Nicholas has a question. Is it recommended to add Google Maps to a service area page? Sure. If it's specific to that area. If it, well, actually, I mean, if, it, if it's useful to the user, which it's not going to really be, but it's, I guess you could. It's not going to help you rank if that's what the question is. I think that's yeah. what the question is, but no, it, it wouldn't really make a difference for ranking purposes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It might make uh, a, a difference for conversion if it's a nice visual map that shows someone uh, this is where we serve in this area up till this line. 
but yeah, that, I'll just weigh in on the conversion side rather than the ranking side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the last question we're going to talk about is just from T. Hi, T. Uh, you know, our local listing sites like Yast, etc., etc., basically going to improve our websites or organic results. Crystal. Um, it depends. <laughs> Yes, but really only if, okay, so for example, we had this test where we started to create these citations because we were looking to move into a certain area using an SAB. So we used their city page and then we also went through and got the, I think there were like 32 of those citations that you could apply for because you're an SAB and you don't want to show your address, only at that time is when I did see that it helped the city page, but that was like like one-off kind of thing. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I did one earlier this year on a test site that had like zero links. To, and we, we went through, I went through about a year and a half of trying different link types and seeing exactly what they did. And I haven't published a study yet, but um, citations did appear to have an impact on organic and not as much of an impact on local, which was very surprising. Um, so I didn't know what to make of that, but they did get some links um, from, you know, those listings that got created yeah. versus no links. So. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Granular. That, that really, that's really it. it. It's just like, am I getting a link? You know, basically, and that just like, you know, adds like, you know, a unknown percentage point to you, your link yeah. equity, quote, unquote, over Very whatever small. you want to call it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's negligible at best. And, you know, Olive brings up a great point. Yext, you're renting with Yext. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Whereas somebody like Bright Local or even White Spark Services, you're not renting it. You own. Well, mm -hmm. you have a username and password. Let's put it that way. Um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a link. So a link is a link is a link. You know, it's not going to be. I'm not even going to say it. Screw. Never mind. Um, I've got another thing to say on that, and that's yes, because we're not always thinking about our own site's organic ranking. If we have a look at a um, a brand name search, if any of those citations are actually sites that are going to rank for your brand name term, then it's really important that the information on those sites is useful. So it's going to help organically uh in many ways beyond just ranking your own site yeah exactly yeah and i would think over time though that those links might move off because you have more popular relatable content links that are better to provide yeah. i mean I, I personally i hate citation links i don't use them the, the decline of citations helping in the co has been going down and down and down every single year the only thing I still enjoy or I will use for clients is local citations, hyper, hyper local citations. Those do seem to move the needle a little bit. But again, it's, you know, if it's good for the user, it's good for Google, basically. So that's kind of my my mantra and rule of thumb on it, at least. Um, okay, great. Any, well, I think we're at our end. So um, let's just do any last thoughts and how people can reach you. Crystal, let's start out with you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at I'm Crystal Horton, or you can find me at crystalhorton.com. Excellent. That's Claire? <laughs> uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, you can find me twi on Twitter at Claire Carlisle. Excellent. And also we can find you at Bright Local. Yeah. As well, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and okay, Joy, how about yourself? Uh, my agency is Sterling Sky, so sterlingsky.ca, because uh, I am Canadian. Um, and then the local search forum.com, just local search forum.com, not the sorry. And um, then on Twitter at Joanne Hawkins. And I'll throw one, one thing in there for Joy. You can also find her, uh, her organization, localu.org, uh, which we are, I think all of us are actually part of that. And uh, yes, we're looking forward to November virtual. 
Yay, mm-hmm. no, we're, we're virtual. All right, cool. And then for me, everybody, your host, Ben Fisher. You can find me on Twitter. I'm always there, the social dude. My DMs are open. Yeah, I know. It's an old handle, okay? I just don't want to change <laughs> it's it. It's easy to remember. I like it for the record, so you're fine. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, and then you can reach me, of course, at steadydemand.com. Uh, also, localmarketinginstitute.com as well. We have a webinar that we do there every other week, actually. So thanks, everybody, for coming, and um, have a fantastic week. Have a fantastic weekend. And if you need any help, reach out to any one of us.